I'll speak from up here. So let me just say briefly that what I want to talk about has to do with, first of all, looking for analogies to the question of Palestine, historically and in more recent times. And also, it has to do with trying to shift the nature of the discussion of the question of Palestine away from its normal kind of contours. So normally when we talk about Palestine, we're talking about the occupation, and so what often comes up is occupation, resistance, and settlements, and this kind of thing. And I think that's obviously extremely important. But I think it's also important to understand Palestine in terms, not just of occupation, but in terms of a structure of discrimination, inequality, and injustice that really needs to be understood as a whole, as, as an overall kind of logic. Um, and so the distinction that's often made, repeatedly made, between what happens in the territories that Israel occupied in 1967, meaning the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem on the one hand, and on the other hand, the land inside pre-1967 Israel, that distinction is, I think, at least for my purposes, an utterly false and misleading distinction. So what I think we need to see is the same logic of differentiation and inequality and discrimination and injustice uh, operating seamlessly across the 1967 border. So I think the first step in trying to understand the plan on Palestine is to remove the distinction between 1948 and 1967 from our heads and to talk about a, an overall logic of racial uh, discrimination. And in that sense, it's, it's, I think, most productive to try to understand what's happening in Palestine precisely by way of comparison to other systems of racial discrimination. Um, and of course, you know, there are many examples one can draw on. The two that I want to touch on briefly, one more briefly than the other, are the experience of Jim Crow segregation in the United States. That is the logic that, 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 that produced the, 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 the notion, the language, the slogan of separate but equal, which of course, as I'm sure you know, means separate and unequal, unequal. Um, and more, more recently, perhaps, uh, and more forcefully in some sense, the, apart the analogy with apartheid in South Africa. Um, Sometimes when one talks about apartheid in the case of Palestine, uh, sometimes it's, quite, it's often the case that bringing up the, the analogy of apartheid can produce a very angry reaction among the defenders of uh, the Israeli state and its policies. Um, and the response is often that there is no apartheid and it's not apartheid and we can't talk about apartheid because Israel is a state that treats all of its citizens equally and so on and so forth, or perhaps, Jimmy Carter makes this argument that, yeah, well, there might be apartheid in the occupied territories, but you can't talk about apartheid inside pre-67 Israel. So what I want to say is, in fact, what we're dealing with in the question of Palestine is very much something that hovers back and forth in analogous terms between the experience of Jim Crow segregation in the U.S. and apartheid in apartheid era of South Africa. So the logic of separate and equal or separate and unequal, um, first of all, because it seems like an obvious point to make. I mean, Sleiman, introducing us, talked about the experience of racial segregation in the US. And I think it's, it's worth remembering, for those of you, since most of you are younger than me, not that I'm that old, but, <laughs> but you know, segregation in the US is not, we're not talking about the 18th and 19th century, we're talking about something that happened that, you know, very much a feature of my own lifetime. So it's not that long ago that we're talking about legalized segregation, not to, not to mention all kinds of informal kinds of segregation. Um, it persists, of course, to this day, but the legal framework that, that separated groups within the US from each other, you know, said who has access to what kinds of institutions, schools, for example, and so forth, um, was very much alive in my own lifetime, um, as I said, which is not that long ago. But since we're in an educational institution ourselves, and since we are, for the most part, I think, educators or students, it's important to consider, for example, what it means that if you look at the state of Israel within its pre-67 borders, I'm not talking about the occupied territories, what I'm about to say about pre-67 Israel is also true for the occupied territories, much more obviously in some sense. But it's important to consider what it means that the state of Israel inside its own territory operates two completely distinguished and separate 
educational systems, one for Jewish citizens of the state and one for Palestinian, that is to say, Muslim, Christian, non-Jewish citizens of the state. So when the state looks at its citizens, it has two completely separate education systems, one for Jewish students and one for Muslim and Christian Palestinian students. And these are all citizens of the state, and as I'm sure you know, the state it endlessly likes to proclaim that it treats all of its citizens equally. And yet if you look at its educational infrastructure, you will see right from the get-go, meaning literally right from daycare centers all the way through university, complete segregation that operates at all kinds of levels. For example, the state of Israel invests three times as much in educating a Jewish citizen as it does in educating a non-Jewish citizen despite all of its proclamations of equality. I can go into detail about this if you want to in the question and answer period, but the long and the short of it is that when we're looking at the state and its educational policies and systems and infrastructures, we're looking at a state that, with respect to its own citizens, infrastructurally, legally, juridically, systematically, institutionally, segregates according to whether citizens and hence students are Jewish or not Jewish and clearly gives preference to Jewish over non-Jewish students. And I'm talking about the state within its pre-67 borders, not the occupied territories, but the same logic applies only as I said, much more, uh, much more visibly uh, and obviously. Uh, 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 so. um, I can go on about the, the, the relationship between what's going on in Israel and the logic of separate but equal in the US. We can come back to it if you'd like to in the, in the question and answer period. But let me move on to the question of apartheid in South Africa and to try and flesh out that analogy a little bit more clearly. Again, this is an analogy that is often refuted or, or rejected, or, or, or when one he often one hears that even to make the analogy is to be hateful and to engage in hate talk and this kind of thing. But you know, I think you should we should all of us take these things in a scholarly and educational way and say, well, what exactly was apartheid in South Africa? What, what were its logics? How did it work? what were its legal justifications and bases and so forth. And let's think about it this way. There, there are, there were three basic, uh, there are many, but those, in the cluster of laws that defined apartheid in South Africa, there were three really, really important laws, among others, that I want to pick out, that worked together to reinforce the system of separating people within the state uh, from each other on the basis of racial discrimination. The three core laws that I want to talk about have direct equivalents in Israel. And again, I'm talking about Israel within its pre-67 borders, never mind the West Bank and Gaza, where you can find the same, especially the West Bank and East Jerusalem, where you can find the same kind of discrimination uh, again, much more visibly. I'm talking about within the state. Within, so that is differentiation among citizens of the state, within the territory of the state itself. So the three core laws of apartheid in South Africa were, first of all, the Population Registration Act, secondly, the Group Areas Act, and thirdly, the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act. So these three laws, I'll just consider them very, very briefly by way of analogy. The Population Registration Act in South Africa, an apartheid in South Africa from 1950, basically set up a legal system whereby different citizens of the state were accorded different racial identities by the state and on the basis of those different racial identities were treated more or less unequally. Okay? The exact analogy within the state of Israel, one can find in the fact that the state legally, institutionally, juridically, officially treats its citizens, labels its citizens, and grants them different forms of identity within the territory of the state. So what that means, to be more precise, is that as far as the state of Israel is concerned, officially speaking, legally speaking, institutionally speaking, there is no such thing as Israeli nationality as such. So the state, when classifying its citizens, says, okay, you're all citizens, but you don't all have the same nationality. As far as the state is concerned, Jewish citizens of the state have what the state considers to be Jewish nationality. So if you're not a Jewish citizen of the state, you're a citizen, but you're not Jewish. You don't have Jewish nationality. And since there's no such thing as Israeli nationality, legally speaking, you're classified as having some other kind of nationality. It can be Arab, it can be Muslim, it, it, there's it, different forms of classification that come into play, but the point is that you're not Jewish, and that's really what matters. So the way the state 
treats its citizens to say, okay, these ones over here are Jewish citizens, they are Jewish nationals according to the state, and therefore they have these sets of privileges. And there are laws that say these rights pertain to Jewish citizens of the state, and in fact, in many cases, pertain to Jews anywhere, irrespective of whether they're citizens or not of the state. And I'll talk about some examples of what matters in terms of this kind of thing. And I'm, this is, again, I want to make this, I want to reinforce this point. We're talking about how the state officially classifies its citizens. This isn't sort of, you know, uh, uh, casual discrimination. This is legalized, institutionalized. It's in, the, it's in the way the state issues identity cards. It's in the way the state enters its citizens in official registers of the state, population registers, this kind of thing. It's all legalized and institutionalized. The second law that has a direct equivalent in Israel today, the second apartheid law, is the Group Areas Act, which was an act, which was a law in South Africa that said, okay, so on the basis of the racial classification that the state has given you as citizens of the state, these people have to live in these areas. So if you're black, you have to live here. If you're white, you have to live here. And these other people have to live in these other areas. So there's a way of trying to distribute the unequal population of the state in unequal uh, uh, re residential areas. Basically, you want to think of it in terms of zoning, that's more or less what it comes down to. So blacks live here, whites live here, etc. The Israel has exactly the same kind of logic that operates, whereby Palestinians and, and Jewish citizens of the state, and I'm talking about the state within the 67 borders, in addition to, of course, the occupied territories within their settlements, um, live in completely different areas. So there are there aren't there. The way towns and villages work inside Israel is the majority of the land of the state is sort of is made available to Jewish citizens of the state. About 85% of the state's land is open to Jewish citizens of the state. In order to live there, you basically basically you have to be Jewish, right? And if you're not Jewish, which is say if you're Palestinian, a citizen of the state, you are you can live in other in areas that are designated for you that you are allowed to live there, which is obviously a much smaller amount of the, the land in the state. And it, it keeps you separate from the areas where Jewish citizens get to live. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, if you want, geographical or spatial distribution of inequality that corresponds exactly to the inequality that, that operates at a, at a juridical or, or institutional level among citizens of the state. And again, I can go into more detail about this in the Q&A period if you want to. And the final apartheid law that I want to reference is the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, which of course made it illegal for a black person to marry a white person or a colored person and so forth in, South, in apartheid era South Africa. And there's an exact equivalent again in the way in which Israeli uh, personal status laws operate. It's not possible for somebody in Israel who's Jewish to marry somebody who's not Jewish. There is no such thing as civil marriage in Israel. So if you're Jewish, you can only marry somebody else who's Jewish. You can't marry a Muslim or a Christian. So, what that means is that there's no way, when you go back to how these things all work together, if you are classified with a state of belonging to this nationality as opposed to that nationality, and hence you have to live in this part of the country as opposed to that part of the country, in this neighborhood, in this area, in this city, whatever, and on top of that, you can't marry this other person. There's no way to do it legally within the state. So what all these things together do is they, they, they create a formal and structural system, if you want an infrastructural system of separation, and of course, according, according to that, inequality and hence, of course, injustice. So, for instance, to give you a couple of good examples, Palestinians face extreme difficulties trying to access land inside Israel. And I'm not even going to the fact that, of course, almost all of the land inside Israel belongs to Palestinians historically. They were expropriated, and the land was expropriated from them. But other than that, in order to be able to move into a town or a village or whatever, you have to meet the, what are called the social criteria of the town or village, etc. So if you're Palestinian and you want to live in an area that's been designated for Jews, you can't. It just it can't be done. It's, there's no way to do it, essentially. Not just that, but there are other kinds of mechanisms that, that, that target Palestinian citizens of the state on the basis of these legal systems that differentiate the rights to which citizens have access and so forth. So I'm going to stop there and just say, on the basis of these remarks alone, it seems clear, I think, that not only are there analogies between the Palestinian struggle 
and other historical struggles against injustice and inequality and racism, especially the struggle of African Americans in this country, and of course the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, but also that when you think of the Palestinian struggle in this way, it's much easier to understand it as a struggle for justice, and a struggle for equality, and a struggle for rights, which it should be easier, especially for those of us in the United States, to understand. Because this is a country that's at least nominally meant to take seriously the logic of equality, and justice, and unity, after all. Right? I think the organizers of all of Palestinian Women's Week, not just tonight's event, um, I want to just say really quickly that it is an honor to be on this panel. Um, when you are, in some ways, radicalized to think about Palestine as I was this last year, um, a couple names come to mind as people on campus who you can consider allies and intellectual powerhouses. These are two of them. I'd also like to thank the campus administration that makes this space possible. Um, it's not everyone on the administration, but there are some good people who care to have the dialogue and the discussion that is um, something that we would expect from an institution of higher education. And most importantly, I would like to recognize the indigenous people on whose land we now occupy. Why did I begin to include Palestinian topics in my indigenous studies courses? Well, this was a question that was posed to me by one of the organizers of this event, asking me to speak on this topic. Ironically, it was also a question asked to me by a campus administrator who wondered why I felt it was important to criticize Israel. It's like one of those moments when, because you know your interlocutor is really kind of smart, you think, but you don't say, well, because there's these things called books. <laughs> Few books, if any, capture the concomitant justification of Israeli and US colonial power as much as Stephen Solai does the Holy Land in transit colonialism, and the quest for Canaan. Salida expertly traces the myriad of ways that Israel and the United States rely on a shared set of narrative tropes. For example, the chosenness implied in both Zionism and Manifest Destiny. For example, this Zionism and Manifest Destiny combination demands not that land be repatriated, but to counter actually the claim of belonging to land in the first place. So what I do in my classes is I show them how this plays out in the majority of progressivist and civilizational representations of indigenous people that we see throughout Hollywood and even in history and anthropology departments. Salida refers to what he calls the pioneering ingenuity that makes indigenous displacement not only palatable, but a moral certitude. And Salida reminds us that in 1783, this great seal of the United States gets actually anointed with the motto, anoint us, quit this, God smiles on our undertakings. Andrew Jackson later asked, quote, what good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic studded with cities, towns, and prosperous farms? Clearly it's best for all of us that Indians were displaced since we were determined to be here. And we make this nation, and we know how to use land wisely. Salida shows how this rhetoric worked in both the formation of the United States and in the formation in the state of Israel. In his history of both countries, Salida shows us that indigenous people in both lands were literally called beasts, savages, lice, and barbarians in both countries. Salita shows how Native Americans were compared to Arabs and Muslims needing to be civilized, and then how Palestinians were later compared strategically to Indians of North America, and how they must, in the words of Zionist Vladimir Jabotinsky, be terminated. In page after page, Salita shows how the dual attacks on Palestinians and indigenous people of our continent were not similar in some sort of accident of speech writing. Indeed, he shows these dialectics were confederated, and they were conscientious. During the 1948 war, the daily papers in Israel spoke of the Jewish cowboys and the Arab Indians. And the popular discourse in both cases becomes institutional policy. As Salida writes, quote, those with the power to influence a nation's policy are able to incorporate their narratives into the pageantry called the nation. But it was actually an Israeli activist and former Knesset member, Uri Avnery, who gets to the heart of this shared experience. 
He wrote that the reason why people identify the Zionist enterprise with the foundation of America is that, quote, Puritans who founded the American society believed in the Bible. They knew Hebrew. They bore biblical names. They saw themselves literally as New Israel. They called the country New Canaan. And they justified the annihilation of the natives with the biblical injunction against the Amalek. The Zionist pioneers resemble the white settlers in America. The bad Palestinians are just simply a newer version of bad engines. Let's face it. According to such tropes, Indians are pretty bad at land use, right? I mean, if they knew how to best use land, then it wouldn't have looked so empty when the smart civilized humans showed up. But that's not just a historical thing, because this continues to the present. Western Apache know that you don't use these no on, or what outsiders call Mount Graham. You relate to him. But that didn't stop the U.S. Congress from approving his clear-cutting for an observatory. That's in my lifetime. And this narrative continues. In the cities in Mexico near the Yaqui homeland where I work with Yuami people, the racism takes the form over disagreements as old as lazy Indians. Its parent claim is that Indians don't know how to use land. And the Mexican government is actually attempting to take away Yaqui lands right now. And so this is how I've come to this talk tonight. But I didn't want to talk about books and theory exactly, though I will actually be testing on an approach that my colleague Susan Foster called kinesthetic empathy and the politics of compassion. Specifically, I want to answer why I understand and teach Palestinian rights as indigenous rights. It's because of corporeality. Of what I've seen and what I've heard from people who live in occupied territories, it's also because Palestinians themselves understand their plight in terms of indigenous people facing ongoing colonization and ethnocide. So part of my task is to take people for their word. But let's start where I must, with my body. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the fact that in collaborating with indigenous peoples and living in their communities, I have come to know a type of daily struggle that can only be approached through an attention to the body. In other words, I can stand in classrooms all day long and talk about how ideologies affect invisibly and visibly almost all perceptions of the world. I can rely on the theories of Althusser or Said until I'm blue in the face. But in, in fact, I don't actually internalize them until I'm blue in the face. When I walk in the dirt streets in the main Pueblo where I work, Potam, I walk among mud-thatched houses where the water flows from garden hoses in the mornings for an hour. And I was warned that when I shower, which is a cup dipped into a pail, I shouldn't let the water run into my mouth. This same village was once near a river of clean flowing water all year round. But in 1937, the Mexican government dammed the river and redirected it to the Mexican city of Obregón, where houses are made of brick and mortar and have running water and plumbing. You see, the homeland of the Yoame people used to be about a half of what is now called the state of Sonora. And the Yaquis were hunted like animals in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. They were cornered on hilltops and they were massacred. They were taken on long walks to the middle of Mexican villages where the women were raped in front of their children. Many traveled barefoot across the Sonoran Desert to get to Arizona for some relief. And when these Indians were finally offered a chance to have a slice of their homeland, some of them returned from their hiding places. I mean, it's amazing how little land you will actually take and call your own just to spare your children's lives from being killed. And it's as if all that wasn't similar enough. The Yaquis actually have this monster, this masked person that comes out during the rituals of Lent. These are monsters that have a Yuame name that can only be said between January and May. So you're actually lucky I get to say the word. Chapeyeka. That's the Yoma word for crooked, big-nosed. Of course, these are the remnants of 16th century anti-Semitism. These people carry whips. They're padded with blankets and huge heads to increase the very real sense that they are powerful. Kids run away from them from the entire ritual season. And as an adult, I walk the opposite direction when I see them because I literally, as a, an adult male, I fear, I fear deeply in my body and if I think they've honed in on me, I, I kind of get freaked out. <clears throat> Powerful feeling, this thing called fear. And we think of it as an internal sensation. But actually, it's the physicality that causes fear in us. Like these monsters in Yaqui Lin, colonizers have finely tuned their physicality to instill fear. 
And fear becomes so strong that it actually persuades people to curve their behavior. It prevents people from helping other people. You don't stop a man from hitting his child in the store if you think he might hit you next for saying something. You tattle on your siblings to stay in good graces with your parents. I mean, these don't have to be complex matters. In some ways, these are actually the very basic conditions of being human. But they are particularly physical exercises or what we might call performances shaped by colonialism. So when I went on drive to the pueblos of Mexico to help my collaborators and visit with my friends in the field site, not only to do research, but sometimes to take gifts or celebrate someone's birthday, I have to travel to Potdam from the United States, which requires, first of all, going through the US-Mexico border. Now, the US-Mexico border is uh, one of those places which you've never passed it inside Nogales. You drive your car, and then it sort of held atop a bunch of stilts and uh, contraptions that allowed them to x-ray the bottom of your car. And you're surrounded by um, two-way mirrors, so you can actually see who's seeing you, but you're being reviewed, your vehicle identification number is being reviewed, your body is being reviewed. I mean, if you're like me, it's like one of those things where you think a cop has actually spotted you on the radar, and so you sit there and you kind of pretend like everything's cool, you just, you know, I'm singing a song, I'm not a bad person, I'm not going to, you know go do bad things. Uh, yep, they let me through, so I get to go through. And going through is really awesome because you know that you've escaped the first checkpoint. But only four kilometers later, you actually have to get to another checkpoint. And it's these checkpoints where when they stop you, they really do make you open everything that you have. They want to see everything that possibly could be there. Shit, this person's literate. <laughs> Probably not a good sign. <laughs> Clearly dangerous. R reminds you of Wounded Knee when they took away women's crochet needles because they were considered weapons. So then you escape and you get past four kilometers and you get to Empalme. And Palm Bay is interesting because it's a state-run checkpoint. The state-run checkpoints are more dangerous because you have more local cops, which means they can ask for um, price. The thing about having rides possible is that you get to have a lot more power over something really smart, which is to say to them that I'm going to go meet the parents of my Mexican girlfriend to ask for her hand in marriage. I'm a straight guy, sticking a dowry to male patriarchy, so you should let me pass. It's one of those things that you learn a trick to actually get through the checkpoint. Then you get the potam. Potom is the last one, but what's so interesting about Potom is it is at the turnoff into indigenous homelands. The one at Potom is ran by narco federales. These are drug spotting federal police. Their machinery is purchased and made in the US. And they carry machine guns and they will do anything they want to you to embarrass you to make you feel like complete shit. And the worst thing about that is that they're there, funded by the US government to stop drugs, and there are no drugs that grow in Yaqui homeland, and that area is not actually used for trafficking of drugs at all. Which means that the Mexican government is empowering, through the use of US dollars, its own surveillance of indigenous people. I'm sure you're smart enough to see the metaphor here. <laughs> When I stop at these checkpoints, I'm filled with nervousness. I'm really worried that, in fact, I'm going to get stopped. And, in fact, start thinking, why do I even do this work? It's a lot easier if I didn't try to help my Indian friends. I mean, this is Indian territory. By the time I crossed the Palme, I was already in traditional UMA lands. And now I have to actually 
admit that someone else has control and power. I'm, maybe I start thinking that is the point of checkpoints. If you know there's no drugs there, then why are you checking for drugs? Is it just to be a physical reminder of control? When you hear the complaints from Berkeley about the injustice and feelings of being insulted at the mock checkpoints in their Palestinian Awareness Week last year, you can't help but think, um, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> the point is to be held up. The point is to delay. The point is to intimidate. The point is to survey and control movement. And the result on one's pride, on one's humanity, well, it takes a toll. And if you pay attention, you start seeing how you self, you start to look down and not make eye contact, how your shoulders start to cave so you don't look too broad or proud. If you're big like me, you bend your knees a little so you don't look offensive. You have to control your emotions so you don't look frustrated or incensed. You have to don respect when what you feel is disgust. And so the checkpoints actually cause you to start lying to your body. You feel mad, but you show submission. You look at yourself. They've turned you into the animal that they called you to justify their taking of your land in the first place. There are other checkpoints too. Like when I walk down the street, I can get an example here. When I'm walking down the street in a Mexican city that's near the Pueblo, the people who feel the most upset that the Yaquis have their land, they have this thing the Yaquis call, he gave me an Indian. And what that means to down Indio is to walk by someone and to push them and not move out of their way. There's this other thing that they do as well, which is that if you're walking inside the market, and since the Indians are wearing saddles and you usually have boots or shoes on, you intentionally step on their Achilles heel. And then when they turn around, you just stand there and stare at them. These are a type, thank you so much. These are type of checkpoints that exist for the indigenous people who live in their own land. When I rushed one of my godchildren who had fallen to the state-funded hospital, I was told by the Mexican doctor, quote, perhaps these Indians should stop having kids if they can't take care of them. <laughs> this is a checkpoint, and it's seen if I'll say anything back to risk the care of the child, which is now in that doctor's hand. When the waitresses at restaurants only take the orders from me, when I'm taking my indigenous friends for a meal and the waitresses don't look them in the eye, not wanting to lower themselves by taking an order from an Indian, these are checkpoints. Do we want to be served or not cause a scene? We will comply. Of course, checkpoints are a bit of a shared experience. I tip accordingly. But at the end of the day, when all you wanted was to live your life, you can't help feeling in your body the sum total of all the times you were checked at some point. This is a big one. You just feel fatigue. You just wanted to go visit your friends. You wanted to say hello <laughs> for their birthday or take them a gift. You just want to go do your work. And this uh, fatigue is unshakable. I mean, it's like the heat or the lack of fresh fruits and vegetables or the lack of clean water. And this fatigue wears on you like the knowledge that it didn't used to be this way. Someone came in at some moment and did this to you in your land and that others let it happen. Others are letting it happen. This fatigue changes your body. It changes how you want to be loved or how you want to love. And this fatigue, this fatigue is colonization. Mm. And it requires that we pay attention to all the checkpoints in our life. When the chair of the academic senate at his own decision decides to review my teaching to determine if I'm an anti-Semite for teaching about the boycott movement, that's a checkpoint. <clears throat> it serves to establish a type of control that others can see. It leads to, and you wonder why there are no women of color perhaps on this panel, it leads to untenured women coming to my office and saying, I've been afraid to say anything because I want to get tenure here. And how I respond in committee after committee as I'm now seeking redress, these are all checkpoints, checkpoints of people's consciousness. Checkpoints to see if I will recant and say I'm sorry for having a political opinion. How one responds in these circumstances could affect one's tenure and promotion. And so literally, they are a means of, to keep people from passing on their academic career. When community and campus leaders decide if they want to verbally and publicly support their support, publicly voice their support for my teaching about Israeli colonization, they are at checkpoints having to weigh the judgment of their donors, their friends, their family's approval. When the U.S. Senate needs to confirm that Chuck Hagel will not continue to support Palestinian people, this is a checkpoint. 
When the DNC has to reverse its position on economically supporting Israel, this is a checkpoint. When Ahmad Bernat is detained at LAX after being nominated for an Academy Award, this is a checkpoint. But what is being checked? As this broader framing of checkpoints helps us see, it's really not about the clothes, the supposed drugs, the bombs. It's about control and surveillance, and it's about living in a settler colony. It's about making sure no one disrupts or pulls the mythic rug out from under our justification for our settler privilege. And it's not just Native people being checked out. It's anyone who might show signs of supporting decolonization, both generally and its specifics. Who supports giving land back? Ask your parents. Ask your church. Ask your rabbis. Why don't we give back what we know was stolen? See how long before you get checkpointed. Yeah, I just verbed that. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, all of this is causing a lot of fatigue. It caused me fatigue to have to go through this checkpoint last year about my teaching. And I have to remember that my body knows when I'm afraid, and my body knows how to be brave, and I have to remind myself that I'm not at a checkpoint, so I can pull my shoulders back, and I can raise the crown of my head a little, and I can feel my being. I can decolonize my body's posture, because although I'm not yaki, I have learned to be kinesthetically empathetic with them because my body has been subjected to their realities. It's this idea of how to understand colonizing choreographies that leads me to defend myself against the internalizations of all these checkpoints in life. And it's this empathy that has led me to be committed to the cause of indigenous rights here in the native lands that I visited on this continent. I return to these lands when I'm invited, and I've attempted to present at events like this when I'm invited. So when I've been asked and I come to speak about how I understand Palestinian rights to be indigenous rights, I didn't want to once again refer to the International Court of Justice or the United Nations or Desmond Tutu or Jimmy Carter or Judith Butler or Noam Chomsky or Angela Davis. <laughs> I didn't want to quote too many books or lectures about theories of indigeneity or settler colonialism. I wanted to show up in my body and tell you how indigenous struggles feels how colonization feels as I empathize with Native people, being a person privileged by both race and nationality, but abused as a kid, colonized by my education system, epistemologically harassed by my insistent media. I empathize. I embody the feelings of fear and of hope because I don't need Fanon or Saucer or Tuwai Smith to know that those holding the whip and the machine guns, those dispossessing and colonizing, they are proving themselves the savages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that, that, was that was wonderful. Um, but both of the presentations by my colleagues were, as expected, stunning and insightful and it, it reminds me um, why I left uh, a private university to come to UCLA, <laughs> to come here to be with colleagues like this, to be with students like you, to be involved with anything having to do with SJP, which is one of my favorite organizations of all time. Um, and to really talk about having uh, comrades you know, to have real comrades. I mean, um, I, when I first met uh, DC, I was like, his book changed my life. Mm -hmm. and it was a book that I read on my way to, to Palestine uh, in January of 2012, and it really changed my life. Uh, corresponding with David Shorter and his struggles, you don't even have a clue how much pressure he was on unless you were in his class. It's tremendous, and the fact is, you know, we're living, we're living in a moment when the university could spend all this money to produce a climate report, right? And not even deal with the oppression in the 21st century, deep into it, of our faculty in a climate that's supposed to believe in um, academic freedom. But we'll get to that. Um, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I also really am always excited um, about the work that SJP does all the time, not just Palestine and Women's Week, but all the time. And it reminds me of my days back in the 1980s here at UCLA, uh, the heart of the, the sort of height of the anti-apartheid movement. We had Tent City. Uh, I had organized a conference in 1984 on imperialism, actually, called Imperialism Real Imagine. 
and invited a representative from the PLO. Uh, and what happened, of course, the Jewish Defense League showed up, as they showed up to everything, armed. Um, <laughs> and when my sister, who was the chair of the Black Student Alliance, also organized an event and brought members of the PLO, it's about 1983, um, Jewish Defense League showed up, you know, armed. And I don't ever remember the university putting out a climate report uh, under those circumstances. But it was very interesting, though. And by the way, um, the President's Advisory Council on Campus Climate, Culture, and Inclusion is a checkpoint. Okay, if you don't, if you don't know, read it. Um, okay, so I was supposed, I am supposed to address two questions. Uh, one, what are the similarities between the struggles of Palestinians and the struggles of African Americans? And two, why is it important for African Americans to stand for Palestinian rights? The first I'm going to address very briefly, in part because Professor Magdisi provided brilliant examples with regard to apartheid. <coughs> um, and, you know, it's just, they're, 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 um, they, they're just very direct and irrefutable examples, particularly when you look inside of Israel itself. Um, I'm also uh, interested in context, because one of the things that happens when we make too many comparisons, um, like for example, you know, the historical context, if it's very different, can change the circumstance. Like for example, we talk about uh, al Nakba uh, and histories of black uh, of violent dispossession. I mean, sometimes those histories can be uh, a century apart or more. If you think about the legacy of settler colonialism on African Americans and people of African descent all over, I mean, these are really useful comparisons to make. Um, we can think about the draconian system of apartheid and formal segregation, um, or more recently, the state's use of the prison as a means of disciplining and warehousing Palestinians and black people, and that can go on and on and on. Um, but my worry always is that none of these really captured the specificity of violence, dispossession, and subjugation that Palestinians face, uh, or the particular facts on the ground. Um, it's not, as, as Professor McDesey pointed out, uh, Desmond Tutu is one of many who say the conditions in Palestine and the occupied territories, let alone inside of Israel, are worse than apartheid in South Africa. That doesn't mean that apartheid in South Africa wasn't violent, people died as a result. What it means is that sometimes we underestimate, unless we sort of know what's going on, what the situation is, is like, what the occupation looks like, what the conditions inside of Israel look like for Palestinians. Um, likewise, if we think about comparisons with regard to strategies and tactics of movement, sometimes the comparisons have been used, action, uh, um, used by liberals to bludgeon uh, Palestinian organizations. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, for so long, the big mantra among liberals is, "Why? Well, how many Palestinians can't be nonviolent? How can they can be the leader an organization like you know the uh, Southern comes to the, the SELC or SNCC or nonviolent movements?" And then when Palestinian civil society groups actually do form a nonviolent movement, that's BDS, is considered a terrorist organization. You know, it's criminalized. So you can't win. No matter what, um, so just that's just my my, um, my little introduction. But the second question for me is a bit easier, though. When you combine it with the first question, it gets complicated. So my personal answer to the question of why should African Americans be in solidarity with Palestinians? I mean, it's simple. Everyone should stand for justice everywhere. Period. It doesn't matter where you. Included, but what does it actually mean, and what are the lessons we might take from the black freedom movements? And that, to me, is the question I want to wrestle with. Because uh, it gets complicated and clearer at the same time. It allows us, for example, to acknowledge that shared race or nationality alone doesn't make a movement. Being black doesn't make a movement, trust me. <laughs> um, and indeed, Black people have often served as junior partners to our oppressors. Mm. Lieutenants in the army of white supremacy and class oppression. 
overlords and patriarchal systems of gender and sexual subjugation, promoters, defenders, spokespersons for neoliberalism as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I know more Negro neoliberals than I know, you know, black socialists, sadly. <laughs> Not that I'm friends with them, but I just know them. <laughs> and when it comes to the question of African American solidarity with Palestine, we have to acknowledge the plethora of black Zionist organizations committed to defending mm -hmm. Israel and supporting the war on Palestinians. Um, and I, and I, I feel bad, I feel like I'm bringing everybody down now. Okay? <laughs> uh, APAC and Christians United for Israel, Kufi, have been working overtime to recruit black students, elected officials, religious leaders, to serve as moral shields for Israel's policies of subjugation, settlement, segregation, and dispossession. And then there is the reprehensible Negro apologist uh, in the form of the Vanguard Leadership Group, which I've written about, a self-proclaimed student group made up of graduates from historically black colleges and universities, its leadership, of course, on the payroll for APAC. On the payroll, not even like hidden money. Um, they're official leaders. So what, what is new about the circumstance with regard to kind of black Zionist organizations uh, is the degree to which the Israel lobby is working hard to recruit African Americans and other people of color. But black support for Israel goes way back to its founding in 1948. And it's complicated. It has to do with things like the prevalence of the ways in which African Americans have read the Old Testament as a kind of <coughs> metaphor for understanding New World slavery. Okay? That's part of it. It's also tied to the persistence um, or I should say, the persistence of this way of thinking has much to do with our utter ignorance of the global landscape made possible by the everyday miseducation of the media and formal education that we get at high level universities like this one, uh, let alone public schools. So figures as diverse, to go back in time, figures as diverse as Walter White with the NAACP, W. Du Bois, A. Philip Randolph, all celebrated the founding of Israel in 1948. They called for partition and were eerily silent on uh, not. The NACP passed a resolution stating that, quote, the valiant struggle of the people of Israel for independence serves as an inspiration to all persecuted, persecuted people throughout the world. Now, of course, the position shift, partly uh, as a result of the 67 war, uh, partly as you know, black radicals proclaim solidarity with Palestinian resistance as a national liberation movement. Now certainly, there are direct examples of solidarity uh, with Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, with the Black Panther Party, uh, the, uh, the creation of the Black Panther Party of Israel, which is made up mostly of the Israeli Um But then, once we start looking at this, we have to interrogate a kind of knee-jerk nationalism that has informed so many of our movements in solidarity with national liberation struggles. And I'm old enough um, to, to have gone through some of these knee-jerk nationalist movements myself. Um, and I, I, think, I think I'm the oldest person on the panel. In fact, I know I'm the oldest person. Um, so what, are this, what, what, what does this look like? Well, the formulation that you know, all Palestinians are good and oppressed, all Israelis are bad and oppressors, and we end up with a critique, and a bereft, really, of a critique of the Palestinian Authority, uh, of Palestinian elites pr uh, promoting neoliberal policies, or the place of the Israeli left, or what it means when software companies are exploiting ultra-Orthodox women in the occupied territories to work as low-wage laborers, um, or the various political, ideological, and class contradictions that erupt in any movement. In other words, things are far more complicated sometimes, and we have to confront those complications. Um, more importantly, we get locked into a kind of identity politics that can be paralyzing, and that can hinder our ability to develop a deeper analysis of occupation and a critique of nationalism, despite the fact that we read Fanon. Sometimes we don't read Fanon very carefully. <laughs> and indeed, it's that kind of nationalist um, thinking that is partly, that partly explains why someone like my hero, what I'm saying my intellectual hero, W.B. Du Bois, could tout the creation of Israel as an assertion of self-determination and as a model for Africa, the Caribbean, and the American Negro. 
So here we have an interesting case in point. What do you do with Ralph Bunch? Okay. Now I'm I'm in Bunch Hall <laughs> in this room, right? My window's open. Every 30 minutes, someone is coming by giving a tour, saying, This is Ralph Bunch Hall. Ralph Bunch was the first black person with a Nobel Prize, blah blah blah, blah and he did this to create the creation of Israel. Well, what do we know about Ralph Bunch? It's very interesting. Most of us know him as the UN Secretary for Peacekeeping who helped negotiate the end to the Arab-Israeli War in 1948 on terms generally considered favorable to Israel. True. He also becomes increasingly conservative over time and in some ways comes across as a kind of traitor to the struggles for justice. But then I'm reading this really amazing forthcoming book by Alex Lubin who reminds us and I kind of didn't realize this, that Ralph Bunch actually comes out of a Marxist tradition. And in fact, his initial counters with the question of Palestine, in those encounters, he was dealing with a Jewish and Palestinian left attempting to move beyond the disastrous nationalism that left Europe in shambles. And instead, he and they were pushing for a binational or post-national solution instead of partition. In other words, one nation for two people, or for all people. That's what he was pushing for. One nation, not partition. Okay? Whatever the outcome is, is one thing, but that's what he was pushing for. And for that, he got flat. Even the boys attacked him on that. So here we are in a moment when progressives are coming to terms with what it means to create one secular <coughs> nation. Right? Ralph Bunch was already there. And he was there in part because it comes out of a particular Marxist tradition where binationalism made perfect sense. He wasn't about, he said, if you create a Jewish state, it's going to be a disaster. And more importantly, he got support from Jewish radicals in, Palest in the Palestinian left who said the same thing at the time. We have to know that history. If you really want deep solidarity, you have to know the whole history. And so, in some ways, these might be extreme examples, but they're important. They reveal how difficult solidarity can be. How difficult solidarity and struggle can be is actually evident uh, in the formation of an organization I'm a part of that was formed just this summer um, called uh, African Americans for Justice in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the, the, the real source behind that organization was the great, uh, is the great Bill Fletcher. They were organizer, he was the head of Trans Africa for a while, and he decided to bring a lot of us together who were concerned about this issue and say, look, we're going to have a position. Now, if you think um, having a position is an easy thing to do, be on a conference call <laughs> as we try to draft the statement just to announce an organization. Mm -hmm. Three hours on the phone trying to figure out what to say, what is our position. Okay, so this is very, very important. Um, again, I don't want us to get caught up too much into this idea that you just show up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you show up and you debate. Sometimes you show up and you disagree. Sometimes you show up and you learn something you didn't know before. Because struggle is a process. Um, so, you go back to um, the, the sh short for Ajmina, which is African Americans for Justice in the Middle East uh, in North Africa. The idea was to bring together, to build solidarity with the peoples and progressive social movements in North Africa and the East, fighting for democracy, national liberation, justice, and an end to occupation. Uh, we identified with the long standing tradition of pan Africanism and black internationalism. Uh, we're open to building alliances with anyone who shares a commitment to justice. Uh, we also believe that those of us in the US actually do have a special duty to speak out. In the, belly of the, in the belly of the beast, especially given U.S. support for Israel's occupation and other policies that undermine peace, justice, and democracy and pop up a system of <coughs> subjugation, not only of Palestinians, but of the Mizrahim, of the Bedouin, of Africans, of immigrant labor from Asia, and the Arab world, or wherever, that we have to basically understand this. Our principles of unity include support for all genuine progressive struggles for national liberation, national sovereignty, justice and democracy, uh, support for the struggle of the Palestinian people, end occupation, the right of return, 
equality and justice and full rights for all including Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel. And though our statement doesn't say this explicitly, we support BDS very strongly. Um, so just in closing, I think it's not enough to have solidarity. Uh, we need an analysis that can only come from study and engagement, and we cannot be afraid of our conclusions. Um, Edward Said understood this better than anyone. He consistently forced us to question old categories, re-examine ethnic boundaries, and challenge received opinions in order to envision a new era of peace based on reconciliation uh, between Palestinians and Jews. At the same time, as a radical humanist, he insisted on a deeper democratic transformation, not just for Israel-Palestine, but for the entire world, including the Arab world. In fact, his critique of Israel was leveled alongside uh, his sharp criticisms of Arab elites and neoliberal policies. And though he may not have anticipated the Arab Spring, he called for it when he wrote, you know, the current Arab situation is truly depressing. For the rich in these countries, it is a tax-free zone. The poor are the only ones paying taxes. Meanwhile, the literacy and health problems are on the rise among children and youth. There is no excuse for this state of affairs, and it all stems from a lack of vision, leadership, and democracy in the region. And so finally, I leave the last word to one of my other favorite thinkers, who I think is still relevant today, although he died on March 14, 1883, and that's Karl Marx. In 1844, he wrote, and I always live by these words, if designing if the designing of the future and the proclamation of ready-made solutions for all time is not our affair, then we realize all the more clearly what we have to accomplish in the present. I am speaking of a ruthless criticism of everything existing. Ruthless in two senses. The criticism must not be afraid of our own conclusions, of its own conclusions, nor of conflict with the powers that be. Thank you.